equity. My name is Mike Grandinetti, and I am very proud to represent the COVID-19 challenge and to share a little bit about our story. Uh, I represent the COVID-19 challenge as a board member. Very quickly, my background, engineer working in the Valley, ex-McKinsey consultant, C-level executive, early team member of eight VC-backed startups here in Boston, and almost for the last 20 years, a professor and senior lecturer at MIT, at Brown, at Rutgers, and a, a very active mentor, including Techstars and a range of other programs. So imagine for a moment that you can't breathe and how terrifying that must be. Now, of course, some of us who have asthma or chronic respiratory conditions would be able to at least envision this. But right here in Boston, Jim Bellow, a very fit, active, 49-year-old father of three, contracted the coronavirus and spent 32 days at Mass General Hospital on a ventilator. It was an extraordinarily harrowing story that was told in the New York Times. The doctors at Mass General did everything in their power to keep him alive, and thankfully they were able to, although they were very close to losing him several times during that harrowing 32-day experience. So one of the questions becomes, why is that? And I'm sure everybody has heard the name or the word ventilators more in the last few months than they have over their entire lives. We're facing a significant equipment shortage, certainly PPE, we've heard that, but we're also facing a significant amount of shortages of key medical equipment. Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, one of the known global authorities, estimates we're about a half a million ventilators short today, okay? And why did this happen? Well, we can do much better than this, of course. But here's one anecdote that just hints at the challenge. In 2014, Royal Phillips entered into an R&D partnership with the Biomedical Advanced R&D Authority. And using U.S. taxpayer-funded money, they developed what would be a low-cost, ICU-grade ventilator. The R&D effort was successful, and it led to a $14 million contract between Royal Phillips and the Department of Health and Human Services at a unit cost of $3,280 per ventilator. Unfortunately, not a single ventilator over the last six years was delivered from that contract. As we all know, over the last couple of months, there's been a tremendous amount of anxiety and, yes, desperation for people to get their hands on PPE, ventilators, and other critical pieces of equipment. Under the state of duress, Royal Phillips renegotiated its contract with HHS, but this time at a $15,000 per unit cost, 5x the original agreement. It was egregious enough to raise concerns, and U.S. Rep. Raja Krishnamurti, who was from Illinois, uh, educated at Harvard with his JD, uh, very well known for standing up for the middle class, uh, decided that he was going to hold hearings in his subcommittee on economic and consumer policy, which is his mandate under the Committee of Oversight that he serves on. So. Of course, these are the kinds of challenges that led to shortages. And our President of the United States, in typical fashion, on the 27th of March, tweeted, as he so often does, using all capital letters, to exhort and extol Ford and GM to get going on ventilators. And he made it very clear how important it was by adding six exclamation points at the, at the end of this tweet. Well, an unknown Silicon Valley engineer who had 70 Twitter followers responded directly to the tweet, and he asked to have someone call him. His name was sent to authorities in the state of New York, and in desperation, they wired Yaron Oren Pines 7-0, 70 million USD, 
And in six weeks, not a single ventilator has been delivered. And Mr. Oren Pines is not currently findable. And New York State is trying to recover the money. So we can do better than this. We have to do better than this. This is not the first time we've seen significant respiratory types of diseases and pandemics, and it certainly will not be the last. They are happening more and more frequently. At COVID-19, our goal is to close the gap between resources that exist in the world today and those that are vitally needed. Now, how are we going to do this? In my life, I have led over 150 hackathons and design sprints globally. There is nothing more empowering than providing an environment for constrained innovation by allowing teams to form, to attack a challenge with a sense of purpose, and to have some kind of friendly competition between them to allow the best of human ingenuity and innovation capacity to flourish. Each and every time I've led one of these events, I have continued to be impressed and inspired and yes, blown away by what we're capable of. As a validation point, we launched the COVID-19 challenge just over 30 days ago. And in those 30 days, we received 213 submissions from teams in 43 countries, and we've just narrowed down to seven finalists. These are, the seven, these are representatives of the seven teams. We shared with them just last week that they were amongst the chosen seven, and they were extremely excited and proud to continue because the next step is to take their extraordinary designs turn them into prototypes, and very quickly move them into manufacturing. What is really remarkable are the affiliations that these team members have with specific institutions. One team is comprised of eight deans and professors at Stanford, the School of Medicine, the School of Engineering, the School of Applied Physics, combined with someone who is the chief scientist of NVIDIA, and design engineers from the automated vehicle uh, juggernaut Waymo. Another team is literally comprised of rocket scientists, people from NASA, designers at SpaceX, someone who has designed the Mars Curiosity rover that is roving around on the planet right now. I can go on and on. But these are people that are motivated to help the world and, and really responded to the call. It takes a village to run a, a challenge like this. We were blessed with the visionary leadership of Dr. Richard Boyer. Rich is an anesthesiology resident in his final year at the renowned Mass General Hospital. In addition to his medical degree, he also has a PhD in biomedical engineering. Rich has worked at Baxter International designing fusion pumps. He has started two of his own biomedical device startups, so he's no stranger to the innovation process. While he was in quarantine, because he and some of his colleagues had been exposed to the virus, they wanted to think about what else they might be able to do to help the world while they were idled. Along with his colleague, Deanna Berrigan Bradford, who was co-director, and 10 other mass general anesthesiologists, they decided that they would launch this challenge. Along with my friend and long-term colleague, John Stevenson, a career startup tech executive here in Boston, John Nelson, a venture capitalist from Silicon Valley, and I, we have been honored to have a chance to provide guidance to this team as they move forward. We've also been blessed with incredibly generous sponsorship from Zymedica in the world of biomedical engineering and design, from a wide range of leading players in the engineering space, from Onshape, in GrabCAD, in Valispace, in Stratasys, the, the leading 3D printing capability in the world, and someone who has donated all of their healthcare service bureau 3D printing capability in service to people that are looking to innovate around COVID-19. 
So our vision is to reinvent the design of not just ventilators, but of all critical care ICU class medical equipment. We want to use the validated approach that we got out of the COVID challenge. We want to do it both in developed countries as well as in emerging countries as well. And we want to use innovation challenge methodology to create designs that are medically validated, very easy to use. You don't have to have a PhD uh, as a respiratory ther therapist to do it, which is a real challenge for a lot of these critical care ventilators today. Open, completely royalty-free designs using standard parts, leveraging open source economics, making sure that these devices are very easy to manufacture and very affordable to manufacture, and that they are globally scalable. And we are a 5013C nonprofit. So this for us is a labor of love. One of the participants from the OpsVent team at Stanford is the legendary Dr. David Gaba, who is a professor of anesthesiology, whose book is considered a Bible uh, for first year medical students, and was also an associate dean of the Stanford Medical School. When we asked each of the teams why they invested their time doing this, this was his response. If you can save just one person, you can save the world. We intend to save many people with our approach. In order to move to the next level, we are looking to raise $750,000 to do design testing of the seven designs that we are now creating to go through the regulatory process to pay off operational expenses and to get into initial production before we can hand off designs to the world. Our next speaker from the ventilator project uh, is a person that I've had a chance to get to know. We both are comrades in arms and that we are both looking to address the exact same problem. What I love is that we're taking different approaches to it, but we are looking to support one another in any way possible to make sure that we are meeting the needs of anybody who needs a ventilator anywhere in the world. If you have a desire to talk to me and to connect with our team about making a donation or talking about how you can support us in another way, my name, again, Mike Grandinetti. My email address at the bottom of the screen is mike.grand at gmail.com. So once again, on behalf of Dr. Rich Boyer, our founder, and the entire COVID-19 Challenge team, I want to just thank you all for taking the time to allow me to share our story with you. And I wish, wish all of you health and safety, and we look forward to updating you uh, in the weeks and months ahead as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. I know you had a lot of material and, and actually uh, went over 10 minutes. Um, yeah. So technically, we yeah. used our time. But I'd like to just have you answer one question, actually, from Steve. I'm going to put it up here. Yeah. So what are the top highlights? I think it's a great question. And to me, the highlight is when you have a safe environment for people in which to innovate. When you give them a clearly defined challenge and they come into the room with a sense of purpose around that challenge and a high level of just synchronicity and values with their team, magic happens. The human spirit is completely capable of solving any problem it puts its mind to. And I will tell you that I'm a hackathon junkie, Steve. I, there's very few things in life that give me more joy than being in the middle of the chaos of a hackathon and then seeing what comes out the other side. It's bliss. Thank you for a great question, Steve. Okay, Mike, thank you so much. 